Okay, so um, could you guys hear me at home before we get started? Raise your hand. Sir Jim, see? Cool, thank you. All right, all right, all right. So uh, welcome. Today is March 6th, and we're in the uh, CS5311 B class. And um, this week, we're going to go through a short tutorial, and we'll have class next week, and then the following week is spring break. Uh, the date of spring break is March 20th, so which is a Wednesday, so 18th, the week of the 18th is spring break. So, and the midterm will be before spring break, so the midterm will be open after next week's class, and it will be open for at least five or six days. And the midterm is open book, open internet, open programming. Uh, if you're concerned that you have to go back and listen to 10 hours of lecture before the midterm, you know, you could do that. It would be a good thing. It would probably bump you up a grade or two. But uh, you literally, my, my, some of you have taken classes with me before. Uh, most of my questions are researchable or triable. <laughs> In other words, I'll, I'll ask a question and you can look it up. Or you can write a, a simple web page and try it to see if it works or not. If, you know. So um, I, the, the approach I would take is to use the, the exams more as a learning experience because my goal is, you know, to some degree, their assessment to make sure that you are getting some of the concepts and you understand it. But it's not something where you have to memorize <laughs> and then take the test. Uh, the tests are open book. You can have them. There's no time limit. You can have them open as long as you want. Um, you could print it out. Use the old, you know, Jeff Diamond technique of go to it, print it out, and then go back and take it. You can do that. Uh, you can leave it open. You can leave it open all week if you want and, you know, go back. You can, your cat can answer some of the questions, whatever. Uh, but the point is, um, I would try not to be, I don't think any of you are intimidated, but I try not to be too intimidated by it. Uh, you, know, you don't have to study and memorize a bunch of stuff. You could, uh, can you collaborate? <laughs> can you all get together and take the test? You know, uh, that's really up to you. Um, uh, I, officially, you're not allowed to. <laughs> uh, and, and you might not get the full experience of the test if you do that. You might want to take it where you get to sit and ponder and think on your own and say, do I get this or not? So, uh, so that's the midterm. And we'll do a little bit of review uh, today and a little bit of review next week on some of the topics. So some of the things I'll bring you out today will be on the midterm. I'll tell you that now. <laughs> and I might tell you as we go over them. So uh, there's that. There's, uh, what else is there to talk about? The final project. So the final project for this class is due at the end of the class. Uh, but it would be nice if, uh, at least by the midterm, some of you have submitted proposals, but it would be nice if all of you at least put something in there and say, this is what I'd like to be working on. And it doesn't need to be very elaborate. It could be, uh, it could be a sentence or two. So uh, I think I've shared before with you uh, the final project that we worked on on this class last time it was taught in spring of 2012. Uh, and there's a complete tutorial for that. And um, I think it's appropriate for this class as well. Um, and if you go to Santa, and I'll put this link on the uh, eliminate. Let's go to, I think if you go to J Press, Spring 2012. No, you need a G. And uh, you could go really to uh, either the Advanced Dreamweaver or the SQL class. They both use this final project tutorial. And if you click right on here, I'm going to post this exact link in here. Okay. 
And this is a, a very good example of kind of what I'm expecting for a final project. And it's perfectly appropriate if you use this tutorial as a starting point or launch pad for a project. So it doesn't have to be this exact application, but this application essentially has about four pages. Actually, it, it might only have two or three pages. It has, I believe, five different database tables. One, two, three, four, five database tables. Uh, and the finished project, I think I took it down. <laughs> uh, let's see. I would have to uh, install it, and I'll do that and give you a link. But essentially what it does um, is an email newsletter system. So uh, people could, could fill out a form to subscribe to an email, and you or anybody can go to a page and compose an HTML email and, and send that. And we learned a little bit about that last week, right? We, uh, or two weeks ago when we looked at PHP mail. Uh, but this application obviously uses that and a lot more. It uses the database as well. But I would say, you know, this is something we worked on maybe three or four weeks over the last over the last semester towards the end. And all of the code is in here. And not only is the code in here, but there's a complete zip archive of everything you need, the actual code. So you can literally download this zip file and install it and try to get this to work on your own server. I'm sorry? Oh, uh, here, it's, it's right there. And I posted it on the class record. So, um, so this, like I said, this isn't the assignment. It's just an example. And we'll try to, in this class, we'll probably create another similar example, probably not an email newsletter type of thing. Uh, but that's the type of thing I'm looking for, a few database tables. We're going to today explore how to create a database structure like this, how to design a database with multiple tables. Last week, we started working with MySQL. We installed some of the tools we need to use to work with MySQL, right? And then we just created one simple, very simple table. This week, we'll start working on multiple tables and building reports off of those tables. And then next week, we'll start working on some of the inserts, updates, and deletes through forms through a database table or tables. Uh, but almost all of those topics are baked into this tutorial. So uh, you might not want to do this. You might, but, but it's, even if it's not a, a project that interests you, it would be good to review it and sort of see what, what's possible and what the expectations are. You know? um, let's see. Any questions about the project? Beyond that, I uh, I think I do. Um, I think it's on our website. Maybe it's not. Maybe it, uh, you know. I will do that. I'm sorry. So the question was, uh, what are, what is the rubric? Or what are the specific requirements or guidelines for the project? And I will post that uh, in the next day or two. That's a good point. I did it. I think for the other class, but not for this class. Good question. Any other questions? So is the, um, the email part of this not necessarily one that has to be yeah, the fact that you just expect it to use a database back and forth? Uh, that's correct. So the question was, does, it need, does your project need to include any email capability? And no, it doesn't. Um, it's email is something very simple. We did that you know, two projects ago. It's, uh, it's something you probably need to know, but it does definitely doesn't need to be part of your final project. Um, can I give some examples? Uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> you know, um, our, our website is a pretty good example. So let's talk a little bit about that. So I've made some updates to our website. And it is essentially, uh, so it, maybe it's a little bit advanced at this point, because it's, it's, it's probably bigger than I would expect you to work on a project. It has 11 tables, uh, only one page, really. But it is fairly complex. Uh, but it would be an example of a, 
a, an appropriate website uh, project. So what it does is, you know, some of these are just links, but essentially all of this content is sitting in a database. And every you know, this is this is a database table called lessons. And there are 16 lessons to this class. And a lesson has a date and a topic. And when I click on each of these rows in a table, so what do I do? I go to the database and I say literally select all the rows from the lessons table and put them <laughs> in a table that's sitting in the sidebar here. And you know, I could kind of show you the code. I'd be willing even to share this code with you so you can see how, you know, how it works. Uh, and every time you click on one of these, it goes back to the database and gets the more specific data about the lesson. And there are about five or six or seven tables that contain information about the lesson. Uh, this is just within the lesson table itself, a description, but every lesson has a set of exploration, you know, things you can explore, and a set of exercises. And this week I, we added a couple of new features. You can actually submit an exercise, which turns into a new database record, your submission. And if you submit an exercise, it, you know, it shows up. You know, it shows up in your page. Because every student has a little pop-up page. I, I do, but I don't have any exercises. Uh, but let's see who has done exercise. Ashana has submitted some exercise. And you can literally click on here. When you submit an exercise, you can give it a link, and we can go and take a look at the exercise or the GitHub. Oh, you guys want to see something really cool. People complain that I jump around a little bit, but this is pretty cool. Go to Google and type Santa Rosa Yard Maintenance. <laughs> and Joseph's <laughs> page from our class pops up. <laughs> uh, there's a bunch of pages that are popping up from our class. Here's one, Joe Green Yard Maintenance. So uh, you guys could sell these sites because people are going to start getting calls. This guy Joe Green is going to start getting customers. But uh, so the site you built based on my template, if you did that, uh, was very SEO enabled, just to let you know. Uh, but anyway, what was it? <laughs> Where was I? So uh, to answer your question, this website might, be, like I said, it might be more sophisticated than I'd, than I'd expect, but it is a good example of a database enabled web application. Um, I, I, would be, I would be happy to share the, uh, to post my repository publicly so you can fork this code if you want. <laughs> we don't say share anymore, we say fork <laughs> or whatever. Uh, having two database tables, well, it depends on what you're storing it, you know. Okay, so recipes themselves are, uh, yes, yeah, so you would have to think of how many tables it takes to efficiently store recipes. And it's probably going to be more than two tables. So yeah. <laughs> uh, there's 11 tables that make up this, that make up this web page, right? Every time you submit something, it, it gets entered in a table. It, uh, each recipe would not be stored in its own table. Yeah. That would not be a good database. Uh, each, uh, we'll talk about that. But um, so anyway, uh, in addition to submitting, you could actually now, I want to show this off, you can actually now comment on somebody's assignment. And then it just pops up if I say like, great work, and submit it, and hopefully it'll work. Yep. So it just pops up as a little comment, you know. So, uh, you know, it wasn't really designed for that type of thing. It was really designed for more meaningful communication. <laughs> you know, how did you do that? Or I'd like to do that. Or why didn't you do this? Or whatever. Uh, and just great work or whatever. But it is a feature you can use. And the thumbs down is not meant as, you know, some, a way of dissing another student. It's meant, you know, more as a, why didn't you do it this way? Or <laughs> this isn't working type of thing. So anyway, might or might not be appropriate. We'll see how it goes in the class. But don't go around thumbs downing everybody. <laughs> you don't want to, yeah, if you thumbs down everybody, you're going uh, to get thumbs down. So, um, but to answer your question, but, uh, is that, does that help a little bit? 
with your original question, like what? Yeah, and, I, and like I said, I would uh, I would be happy to share, you know, to uh, put this code on a repository that's open, and you can see it. Uh, and and also help you if you want to use some of this. And if somebody comes up for a great project um, enhancing this, I that's a great project. <laughs> I am all for. Let me say one other thing. I think I said this last week regarding the project. Uh, two things actually. I'm all for you doing something that is work. Right? Does that make sense? Um, um, if you have a project that you're working on, or something for work, or something you're doing on your own, that's fine as long as it can fit into the context of what we're doing. And I'll get you the description of what that is. And two, uh, it's also appropriate to work in teams. So. Uh, uh, the project has to be a little bit more than one person's project, but I, you know, uh, in the real world, it's very rare that one person builds a website, so it's perfectly fine to work in a team. I would just like to know what the project is beforehand and know what the team is. So, move on from projects. So, uh, today's tutorial. So let's go to this week's creating a CRUD application. This is the type of thing where if we get it to work, we could say crud. You know? <laughs> we could say oh, okay. So uh, a, a crud application, uh, actually there's a definition on Wikipedia, believe it or not. So I didn't make up this term. You could click here to see it. But essentially a crud application is a database application. It's a, there's thousands of crud applications. In, in fact, there's a quote somewhere on the internet, 90% of websites are CRUD applications. And it's probably even more prominent in non-web applications, traditional desktop applications, clicking or, you know, whatever. Uh, think of those applications where you're interacting with a persistent store of data. You're saving information somewhere. So Amazon is a good example. Or Facebook is a good example. They are databases. Even though you're buying a book, what you're really doing when you're clicking the button is entering a row in the order table at Amazon. And then somebody in Seattle or some warehouse runs a report and sees that row and puts a book in a box for you and sends it to you. Does that make sense? So Amazon is warehouses. It's books. It's all this other stuff. But the thing that makes it work is that inserting a row in a database and then reading that row in the database. Right? And, that, and that, that row in that database is processing throughout the business workflow. Right? It hits your credit card or whatever, whatever your payment system is. It goes to their shipping department. It then goes in your database of records so you can see all of your orders. Uh, and so when you enter the order, you're doing the C, right? Create. You're creating a new row, a new order, right? You're actually doing more than that. You're creating a new master detail database structure. And that's what we're going to be learning today. Usually in relational databases, you're not just dealing with one row. And this answers your question, Lisa. You're dealing typically with a database structure. In other words, an order on Amazon is not just going to hit one table. It's going to hit, it's going to create a row in the orders table, but there's going to be multiple lines of that order. You know, book one, book two, CD three, you know, a mop, whatever, whatever you ordered. <laughs> Each of those is going to be a row. So what you there have is a master detail relationship. And an order may have one or more line items. Does that make sense? That's a master detail relationship in a database. That, that is exactly an example of two tables that are, we have an order table and we have a line items table. And, you, uh, and there's a master detail relationship. You can't have a line item that doesn't belong to an order. You can't have an order that doesn't yet have any, any line items, but it, line items belong to an order. And that's called a master detail or a foreign key relationship. And the world is made up of these things. The world is made up of master detail relationships. 
You could model the world. Uh, not every, not everything in the world, but many, many things that we do in the world have a master detail sort of structure to them. And that's what makes relational databases very useful. The fact that you can model these entities using these relationships in, in sort of a one-to-many or master detail kind of pattern, and the fact that you can easily work with them by creating, updating, re deleting, or reading these specific rows. And we're going to go into more specifics on this. This is what we're going to spend today talking about. So uh, other examples of master detail relationships. Order to line item is one. Um, what's another? Uh, customer. Yeah, so, uh, or, or HR department deals in this, right? Department employees, right? Every employee has to work for a department, and a department may have one or more employees. So the HR department, everything, every form looks like that, <laughs> right? Uh, or a class, in, a class of students, exactly. Our whole application is made up. This website for our class is essentially made up of about eight different master detail relationships. Every, le every syllabus has 16 lessons. Every lesson has an one or more exercises. One, it has multiple ma master detail. It has one more exercises, it has one more explorers, it has one or more readings. And an, and, an, and an exercise can have a submission, and a submission can have a re one or more reviews. And it, it could be a submission for every exercise for every one of you, right? So master detail. That's exactly why you have master detail relationships. So you don't have to put the shipping and receiving department in every employee's record. You could just say department 12. And then in the department table, you could have a row that has department number 12 is shipping and receiving. And they relate to one another through a foreign key relationship. You could say, give me all the employees where the department is equal to 12 and give me the department name. And the, 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 the tables will come together. We're going to demonstrate this. This is done with the language that we use to talk to databases, which is SQL or SQL. Exactly. SQL has the ability to join tables back using those far key relationships to recreate the master detail relationship that you modeled. Right? Remember, this is all modeling. We're taking real world things and trying to replicate them with a computer. Right? <laughs> so, uh, as programmers that are building websites, you know, what, what are these websites doing? What is Amazon doing? It's programming what the guy in Barnes & Noble does, right? <laughs> so, and, and to some degree, that was already programmed in his cash register, and all he did was press the keys, right? But business applications typically try to model what the business does in the best way possible. And that's the way the computer systems help the business do what it does better. Does that make sense? So if you're a business and you sell things, you typically have an order table. And almost every business, an order can be comprised of more than, you know, more than one thing. Uh, if you're a car mechanic, <laughs> it's a little bit more complex if you think about it. Every order might have labor and parts. Right? So it has what's called a bill of materials. Right? If you, in a factory, when you build something, like a, a new Chevy, you get a bill of materials. What are the 12,000 parts that make up <laughs> this product, right? And a bill of materials is another perfect example of a hierarchical or a master detail relationship, right? Uh, employees depart. Another example is uh, it's a little bit, it's not business, and it's a little bit off, but any hierarchical taxonomy can be modeled in a relational database using master detail table relationships. So uh, anybody a biology person or you know scientist, so the Linnaeus system for, for classifying living things, right? Uh, is it in the animal kingdom or the plant kingdom? <laughs> if it's in the animal kingdom, is it carnivore or is it not really, you know? So you go through, uh, you know, uh, kingdom, class, family, uh, genus, species, there's like seven or eight different levels of categorization. Those are perfectly 
appropriate to model in a master detail relationship. Every genus has one or more species. Right? Every family has one or more genuses, <laughs> which have one or more species. Right? So hierarchical data structures and relation and, and master detail or foreign key, one to many, relational data structures are almost synonymous. What the master detail tries to do is model something that's that's known as hierarchical uh, or branched, sort of like uh, a hard drive. We use a hierarchy to divide up our hard drive. You have one hard drive, you can add one or more folders to it, and you can add one or more subfolders to those ad infinitum. And that's a hierarchical master detail relationship. So somewhere in everybody's file system, there is a relational database. So today, what we're going to do is, uh, it's pretty simple actually. You want me to delete that? Uh, <laughs> so you, you, you entered something, but you didn't, uh, that's cool. I could build it. So uh, we talked about this. Uh, yeah, we'll give it a thumbs down. So uh, what we're going to do today, so last week we got started on my SQL workbench which is the tool we're going to use for some of our database operations. For today's lesson, uh, we're not going to build a database from scratch. Uh, so I created a very simple database that we could use as a starter, and we could add to it from there and then build some reports around that to illustrate this example of what I mean by a, a master detail relationship and how it can be used in a PHP web application, okay? So um, to get started, you, you really could just download this file right here. So let me do that again. Uh, on our website for this week, and it's already, it should by default go to this week's lesson, uh, the third, the fourth click down, the, the, the second, not the last one, but the one before it, which is download the music database creation script right there. So I'm going to take that and copy it. And I'm going to stick it in here. Just keep it in your browser for now. We're going to just just don't do anything with it yet. Just look at it. <laughs> just look at it. So uh, the way I create, I didn't write all this code. I created a few tables and then I ran an export. And when you run an export in the MySQL workbench, it will give you both, it'll give you a bunch of comments, but it will give you both the statement that's used to create the table structure, and it will also create the statement that inserts the data that was in the table when it was exported. So I've created an export of a database that, had, that has four tables, and it has data in each of those tables. So, and, it, and what we're going to do is start up MySQL Workbench and connect to your database. Yes, yeah, so you, you probably want to use the, um, for the people in this classroom, the 3306 port is not going to work on the laptops you bring in and use over the Wi-Fi network, so you have to use the cable, the Ethernet cable. Take it out of the computer that that, that is sitting at your desk and put it in your laptop if you have your laptop. If you're using the computer at the desk, you don't need to do that. It should be able to connect. And it should also have MySQL Workbench installed. So uh, as you can see, I have already got these tables created in my database, but the script is going to delete them and rewrite them. So, uh, so let me show you what you need to do. You have, I'll give you a minute to bring Mike's SQL Workbench up. And literally all you need to do is type your database name, right? Uh, you, so you type in use and then your database name. In my case, I'm using test. In your case, you're going to use your user ID. So it would be, uh, you know, P, X, 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 you know what I mean? Uh, your first initial, 
and the seven first letters of your last name. You don't need the underscore admin because the name of your schema is your Unix user ID. I created a second schema because I needed to. And then you click this lightning bolt and that executes the statement. Unknown database test. It doesn't like... I don't think it works. Like I could see it. I could see it, but it doesn't let me use it on this computer. I don't know why. It, it, I, it works on my SQL workbench at home, but for some reason this doesn't let me... This happened last week too. So, what we... Uh, and then once you're, it won't connect even with the Ethernet? Yeah, it should. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, you could do that. That's fine. Yeah, if you have your database, if you have a database running on your local computer, that you could do that. That's fine. Can we, uh, if you have a database running on your local computer, yeah, you could, uh, you could connect by typing in localhost instead of student.sendrose.edu. I don't know what your account is there, you know. You, you, no, but I mean, I don't know if you, she had, you know, you have to have a database and you have to have it set up. So, so, so if you if you want to run this script, uh, you literally could copy it. Yeah, you might want to just follow along on the class computer because that does connect, right? Are you able to connect them? Yeah, well, that's yeah. The way it is. So, uh, yeah, Michael Dell selling his company for what, eighteen billion dollars, and these things too. Uh, so there's a couple of ways that you can run this script. You can just literally copy the entire text and paste it into MySQL Workbench into the into this SQL window right here. I am not going to do that because. For, well, I'll paste it in there, but I'm not going to run it. And the reason is it's not letting me get to my test database, and that's where I have it installed. But you can literally paste that in there and click the lightning bolt, and it should install those tables into your database. You might, like I said, first you have to type in use and your database name, which is your username, and then you could just literally paste that text in there and click that, and it should run. Uh, another way of doing it is you can open that, you could save that text to a file and then open the file using this widget right here in order to run the scripts that are in that file. The important part is what is this script doing? Well, okay, so I created this from, uh, from an export of a database I created. And what I, so let's look at the statements. So first of all, if there is a table in this database called tracks, well, first of all, let's go back. There's four tables in this database. Albums, artists, genres, and tracks. Okay. So what is the hierarchy? I mean, it's not going to say it on that screen. Think logically. What is the hierarchy? By the genre, and all, so uh, very good, very good. So there might be different ways of doing this, right? In other words, Barb Marley, you know, is he world or is he, you know, reggae or is he, you know, maybe this album's reggae and the next one's rock. You know. So data modeling depends on your business and how do you want to best model your business. 
But in general, for the purposes of today's tutorial, I created a table of genres, and then, I, uh, and then an album, a, a genre, can have one or more albums that fit into that genre. I, I'm sorry, artists. <laughs> and then an artist can release one or more albums, and of course an album may contain one or more tracks. So we have a four-table hierarchy, a very straightforward master-detail relationship that is four tiers high. A genre like jazz can contain an artist like Miles Davis who can have one or more albums, and each of those albums can have one or more tracks. Each of those is called an entity. When we model it, and each of those is typically, we usually have a one-to-one -one relationship. We model these things and we say, okay, each of those becomes a table. So that's exactly what we're doing here. We're creating four tables. We're creating, a, and, and we're doing these tables backwards. <laughs> because they have relationships, we have to create the tracks table first because it's going to create a relationship to the table above it. So uh, here's our tracks table. Here's our artists table. Here's our albums table. And here's our genres table. Right? So. Would you go with the more specific thing first? Or uh, typically, the way the export will work, this was created from an export. It's going to uh, create the tables uh, that, that contain the foreign keys first. Um, so. Uh, so each of these tables, the first thing we do is just, this is one very simple SQL statement. Drop table, if exists, tracks. If there's a table there called tracks, it'll delete it. If there isn't, it'll, won't do anything. Right? That is a SQL statement. So what kind of statement is that? Is that a CRUD? Is it a create? Is it a read? Is it an update? Is it delete? It, 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 it's, a trick, it, it's a trick question. Okay. If not, it's neither. Very good. So uh, there, before we get into create, read, update, and delete, which has to do with working with data that's within tables, before we even get to that, we have to create the tables. So at a higher level, SQL statements, the SQL language contains two types of statements, what's called data definition language, DDL, like this, this whole script, or a lot of the script is DDL. It doesn't create data, it creates the structure. It creates the table, or it deletes a table, or it changes a table. And that doesn't, you know, that's not really part of CRUD. Now once those tables are created, the inserts, the updates, the deletes, the, all of that is part of the CRUD. We do that within rows of the table. Once the structure is there, the data goes into the rows and columns of those tables. So this is data definition language. Drop the table. This next statement here is also data definition language. Create a new table. Create a table called tracks. It has one, two, three columns. It has uh, the first column is a special column. We learned about this last week. It's what's known as the primary key. And it has this statement called auto increment. Right? If we look at it uh, in the table, let's see if that thing pops up. Doesn't want me to do that. Uh, it's better to look at it in a statement. Uh, it has three columns. The first column, like I said, is the, is the primary key. We learned this last week. It is auto-incremented. The database creates the data. We don't tell it what the ID of the tracks is. We let the database create it for us. And it auto-increments. It starts at one. The next record's going to be two. The next record's going to be three. And it just gives it a serial number. Every time you create a new track, it gives it a serial number. 
The next column is the foreign key. <laughs> Does that make sense? That is the column that points to the primary key of its master table. That's how you find out what album that track is on. Right? Uh, in SQL, column names are always quoted. The track is just a track name. So every table that I created has a plural name, tracks, albums, artists, genres, and the name, the actual name of each L, uh, of each int, of each uh, record is the singular. So track, album, artist, and genre. Right. So this create this drops a table if it exists. This recreates the table. It puts a foreign key restraint. You cannot have a track unless it has an album ID, right? And you cannot have a track that has an album ID that doesn't exist in the albums table. You cannot do that in this database. The database forces it. You can't have a track without an album. You can't have an album without an artist. Those are called foreign key constraints. So you would ask, how am I able to write these tracks in? I think what they do, somewhere up here, is they turn off the constraints. Uh, maybe not. Uh, I don't know how they're able to insert, because here they are inserting into tracks, and they're inserting album IDs, which is a foreign key. So I think they turn constraints off and then turn them back on when you import this. Has anyone imported this script? Anyone done it? Uh, okay. what? Anybody at home run it? Mine worked as well. It's working. Yeah, so delete. Yeah. Uh, good. So, um, so the next statement inserts the information into the tracks, right? So here's our first track. Uh, one is probably the track number, right? The first value. Second value is going to be the album number. The third is the track name, right? And this is insert into tracks these values. And it's hard to read it on this screen because it's all the way out here. But you insert all these data, all these records. We've got 13, 14, I don't know how many tracks we have. And then if you keep going out here, <laughs> there's got to be a better way to see it. Uh, I'm not sure I understand. Correct. So a foreign key constraint, by definition, requires data that that relates to another table. Not if there's a foreign key constraint on that column. So you don't need to have a foreign key constraint. A foreign key constraint is a tool. Okay. It's a tool that you use to for what? To make sure everything messes up. For data integrity. For data integrity. One thing that relational databases are very good at is giving you tools, programming tools, to ensure database integrity. Right? To ensure that we don't have a track that doesn't belong to an album. We don't have an order of a book that doesn't belong, a line item of a book on Amazon that doesn't belong to an order. And an order that doesn't belong to a customer. Right? <laughs> and, a, and an address that doesn't belong to a customer. And maybe a customer, it doesn't have an address. You know? So databases are very good at giving us tools to implement these constraints at the data level. And what a foreign key constraint does is ensure it's just a, a way of programming it. And you can see it's, 
It's programmed right here, but the easiest way of doing it is to literally draw those lines in the diagrammer, right, that we did last week. And that literally guarantees that you have no broken children, lost orphaned children, right, an employee without a department. The worst thing for a CEO is an employee without a department. You have some guy working in Honolulu somewhere that doesn't report to anybody, making $150,000 a year. You, know, you want to make sure that things fit together in a database. And relational databases are very good at providing that constructural integ integrity. Right? Built into the bit, you could never enter a track <laughs> without it having that. So let, let, let's try that. Right? Let's go to the tracks table and edit the data. You know, it does not let me use the test database, even though I could see it. You get my databases. So you're using my password? Or, uh, <laughs> So what do you mean my databases? Yeah, it's just a model. You probably got it from downloading it. I, I, did, I did give you that model. You were able to download it, and that's, that's what that is. Question home. I have somebody else's database in my SQL. Yeah, uh, and it's full. So uh, I'm not sure what that means. So uh, Sergio. Can you, do you mind uh, <laughs> giving me access so I could take a peek at it? Um, do you uh, text me your your password? How's that? I'm gonna give you my putting my cell phone number out here. You get it? If you could text it to that number. You might you might want me to uh, you might remind me how to spell your last name too. Okay. So while he's doing that, yeah, I'm, I want to check. There, there might be a problem with the server. So uh, remember, we all are sharing the same database. However, we should have separate accounts, and we shouldn't be able to see each other's tables. So I cannot see when I log in. I can't on my student account. I can't see anybody else's tables. So. Yeah, so the Sakilla is something that comes with MySQL Workbench. So if you're t referring to databases that are that are in this section under data modeling, those are in, those are not databases. Those are models. Does that make sense? Those are we talked about this last week. Let me repeat it again. A model is not a database. It is a specification of a database. Just like a blueprint is not your house. Does that make sense? A model is nothing more than a blueprint. It allows you to graphically draw or, in some cases, write how your database should be modeled, but it is not the actual tables. So these are not databases here. 
You cannot insert data into anything that sits in this section. Right? These are not databases either. They are connections to the, or try to be. You generate models. So the question is, can you copy those models across? You can create a model, or you can get a model. I gave you the model from my website database, I think a week or two ago. And from that model, you can forward engineer that into a database. Right? Thank you. But, it, but the model is not a database. And even, I'm going to try to restart this thing. So, and even this is not really a database. <laughs> it is a connection to a database. Let's see. Uh, I want to manage connections. I want to get a studio. I want to get it. What's your username, Sergio? Uh, thanks. Copy this into here. And here you do need the admin or rewrite or something. And then this password. And then the default schema is going to be the same as the user test connection. So your connection works, and mine doesn't. But let's go into your database now. So these are the, I assume you created these. Yeah, so I think you're referring to this center section also, and that, are you talking about Yeah, yeah. So let me repeat that. So those are not, so why can't I see those in my SQL workbench? Because if there's, if there are things in here, they're on your computer. <laughs> they're not on your server. They're, they're not a database. They are a model. Some of you got a model by downloading my model, you know, I gave you that link of my model. Some of you got the sample data model from the MySQL website when you downloaded MySQL Workbench, those, those are not databases, right? A database has tables, right? And database tables have data, right? So here's our albums table. And that is a database. They have data in them, right? You insert data into them. If you try to insert a new album, right? Uh, what's an album? Uh, Rolling Stone, Sticky Fingers. I'm kind of an old guy here. And uh, we try to insert that. There's like a I use a different version of this. Where is the save? Ah. So I'm going to take this SQL statement and insert it into the database, create a new album, right? What happened? We broke the foreign key constraint. We created an album that doesn't have an artist. 
That make sense? That's how strong the following key constraints are. It could be a web page. It could be any application. It could be an, an iPhone app. It could be a Windows Visual Basic form that's entering data into the database. If the database has a foreign key constraint, no matter how you try to program that data in there, it's not going to take it. Right? So that's why database models are so important. Because they bring a lot of the rules that you need to enforce in your business in a centralized manner. You don't have to tell every application programmer you can't insert an album without an artist. They cannot do it. <laughs> it's impossible. So databases go a long way in implementing business rules. Right? Business rules. You can't review somebody's work unless they submitted it. You can't submit an assignment that I didn't assign. <laughs> I can't create an assignment for a lesson that I didn't create. And I can't create a lesson on our web page for a class that doesn't yet exist. Does that make sense? You just cannot do it. And that, does everyone understand the power of that? Right? If, if you were able to do that, and many databases allow you to do that, you can have chaos pretty quickly. Right? You can have islands of information that make no sense at all. Right? Not all applications require foreign key constraints, but the reason I'm harping on it <laughs> is because it's a, a very, very common pattern. So common that the database has built this feature right into it. Right? Does that make sense? So we're going to cancel this. And we don't have the Rolling Stones as an artist, I don't think. Let's go to artists. So, uh, so we, what we could do is create the Rolling Stones here. So let's go. And I could insert this, right? Right, you need the foreign key before, you need the primary key before you can create a foreign key link to it. So first I've got to create a record for the Rolling Stones before I could create an album for them. And I click apply here, and I can't even do that. Because I don't have, well, I probably do have a genre, I just didn't define it. So I think my rock and roll genre is probably two, right? Does it say what genre it is? No, it just has a number, right? I have to go to the genres table, and then I can see two is rock. We have jazz, rock, classical, and world. And two is rock. So if we go back to artists, you can see the Beatles, R2. So I think if I give this a two and apply that, it works. Right? Not only does it work, what else happens? What else happened? It gave it an ID. It did the auto increment feature. So auto increment is what? It's another database constraint. <laughs> you can't have a record that doesn't have a unique identifier, right? And you, so it's a way of ensuring that every record gets a unique identifier, right? Why would you want to use an auto increment or a serializable number instead of just letting the application decide? Because there could be thousands of applications that deal with the same database. And letting the database do that is a very nice design. It's a very nice feature. So auto increment is a, is a nice feature for those applications where the data doesn't inherently have a primary key. Some data comes with a primary key, right? Like books have, what do books have as a primary key? The ISBN number, exactly. Title wouldn't be very good, right? Even for an album, title isn't very good. Uh, obviously, you know, whatever you have, uh, you know, uh, Sergeant Pepper, and you have Sergeant Pepper in the 20th edition, or whatever. You know, but it's not always perfect. You can have albums with the same name. You can have people with the same name. But a unique identifier, especially one generated by the database and assigned to that specific record, is a guarantee that you can always, it's, a, it's like a social security number when a kid is born. You know that that is that person. Sorry, Lisa. Yeah, actually, it's like, uh, Did you have written that um, insertion routine so that if it saw that there wasn't the, the world stones already in there, that it could automatically 
so the question is, the question is, can you write program a database insert in such a way that it automatically creates the following key? And I don't believe that it's possible to do that with SQL, but that is something that would be very possible and easy to do with PHP. Because SQL is not really a, it's a programming language, but it's a declarative programming language. You can't have if statements. Yeah, but, yeah, you're right. So uh, you're talking about, yeah, yeah, yeah. Th that's a statement in the script. It's not really a SQL statement. Uh, it's part of the export feature of my, you know. Uh, you, SQL doesn't, you, you, there might be features in some databases that have an auto foreign key, but I think in most cases you will want the application to handle that part of the logic. So you'd, you'd write some PHP function that says, if there is no foreign key, create one. Typically, the way foreign keys work <coughs> in applications is they're lookup tables, right? You're entering a new artist. You know, you're, you're, you're at iTunes. You know, you work for Capitol Records, right? And they're releasing a new record next week. So the guy comes in and goes, you know, we're releasing the, you know, the monkey's greatest hits. You need to enter that in our system. And then enter it in Amazon. And enter it in iTunes, right? So you go in there and you start entering the album, and the first thing it's going to say is who's the artist or who's the genre. Typically, in an application, those will show up as drop-down lists or something like that, or lookup items, right? To make sure that your phone key, it's a drop-downs and select lists on web pages are perfect examples of how to implement a foreign key when you're implementing data. Does that make sense? When you, uh, when you insert an album, it'll say, who is this, you know, what, what's the genre for it? And it'll give you a list of genres. <laughs> That's going to be the foreign key to the genre table, right? In this case, we're using MySQL Workbench and entering it in the table. We don't have the luxury. You know, it's very simple. I have to look at the other table to see what the key is. It doesn't give us an easy way of looking it up. Obviously, you know, this is fully connected to the backend database. You know, if you want to pass forward to the Amazon database, you could enter orders through this to figure out what table to enter them into, right? But nobody wants to use this. It's, it's a ta you know, it doesn't have a lot of features. It doesn't have drop downs. It doesn't really, you know, it's, it's a very simple way of interacting with data. It gives you some feedback, but it doesn't really help you with the data. We want to build applications that help you to make it easy, like Amazon, to order something. You don't know when you select your shipping address on Amazon that you're choosing a foreign key. <laughs> All you know is that Amazon knows you have three or four addresses. You know, your summer home, your beach home, your place on Lago de Cotilleto in, in Milan, and, you know, your little two-bedroom place in Santa Rosa. So you have to choose your shipping address, right? And that's really a foreign key relationship to your customer, your, your role on the customer table. But they don't tell you it's a foreign key. They don't tell you it's a lookup. They just give you a drop down and say, where do you want this to go? Or do you want to create a new one? <laughs> Does that make sense? So our job as application developers is to remove this complexity from the user, but use these patterns in a way that help make our business, or whatever it is we're trying to do, work correctly. And like I said, this master detail pattern thing, this foreign key thing is something that's predominant throughout almost everything we do. And it's, and that, that's why I think it takes, you know, it, 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 it's worth the time to see how databases deal with these hierarchical relationships. Yeah, yeah, so uh, that's a very good question. So these tables are, like, really, really minimal. You know, all they have is names in them, right? In the real world, there's going to be more information about each of these. Right? There's going to be a picture for every album, or maybe 10 pictures for every album. Album cover, back cover, you know, the, the list of all the songs and who played on them, and you know, five pages about how it was recorded and all this stuff. So uh, there's other data that can be captured in these tables for the purposes of what we're doing right here in this class right now. This is, like I said, a very simple script down data base to illustrate the master detail relationships. Is it, is it 
Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, very good question. So, data is held in tables, and tables are composed of columns. And like I said last week, columns have different data types. You can enter some data types allow you to enter terabytes of data. Right? If you want to enter the flat, lossless recorded version of, you know, uh, whatever, the London Symphony doing Mozart's third movement, which is an hour and a half long, that might be, you know, 500 gigabyte, uh, megabytes of MP3 data or flat data. You could s theoretically store that in a database column as a blob, bl binary large object. And there are different types of blobs. So let's, uh, you can ask me a question. Uh, each, each of these tables represents an entity, isn't it? It's a thing. We're, we'll get to that. Yeah. So um, let's edit our tracks table and look at it. So what is it? You bring up a, a very good point, Anna. Right? This is a very minimal database. There's not a lot of data in it. Let's add some data to it to learn a little bit about how we initially model data. In addition to these master detail relationships and the database integrity piece, the most important thing about modeling your database is to put the information about an entity into that entity and to put information that doesn't directly pertain to that entity in another entity. Does that make sense? So genre. Why don't I just put rock into, you know, the Rolling Stones and the Beatles? <laughs> uh, uh, because I might misspell rock one time. <laughs> and then my database is all screwed up. Because I'm going to go, how many rock albums do I sell? And the Rolling Stones are going to be left off because this guy spelled it in French or something. So you see what I mean? Database integrity. That's what foreign keys provide, <laughs> right? <laughs> you spell rock correctly once, and it's there, it's, right? And it's, it's accessible to all of them, number one. Number two is you save space. Instead of putting rock in every record, you just put a very simple integer. And that integer could be a full letter word like rock, or it could be a, an essay. <laughs> Or it could be a whole other data structure. <laughs> so the point is the, these relationships are, uh, are, um, are designed to keep your data uh, consistent and not repetitive. And, uh, and to make that happen, like I was saying before, an entity can, should contain the data that pertains to that entity specifically, and if it doesn't, if it's more general than an entity, move it up into another entity. So what would be specific to an album? Uh, we're in the tracks here. If we go to, or, or let's look at artists. So what would be specific to an artist? Uh, we have a genre. We have an ID. We have a primary key for them. We have a name. What else would be something that pertains specifically to him? His birth date. Very good. Very good. So what we would do is go to the artist table and go alter table. And we'd add a column. If we wanted to track this information, right? We'd add a column called Birthday, right? Unless, yeah. What's the what's the birthday of the Beatles? Right. <laughs> or the London Symphony Orchestra, or uh, yeah, or or yeah. So, uh, birthday might not be the best. What else is specific to an artist? 
Recording company. Should we put? Should we spell out the recording company in here? Should we put a re another foreign key relationship? So, in the world we live in now, in music, it's kind of weird. We have f the big five record labels, and then every artist has their own record label these days. So there's a lot of record labels, but it still makes a lot of sense to have a label table with a primary key. And that primary key can be referenced as the foreign key constraint in our artist table. In fact, it doesn't even need a foreign key constraint because you can have an artist without a label, theoretically. Can they release an album without a label? Maybe, maybe not. In fact, that's part of your data modeling is to draw it up in your blueprint and then bring it into the boss and say, is this how it works? Is this going to work for us? Do we have artists without, out, without labels? Do we sell tracks without albums? Do we have freelance albums that don't have an artist to them? What about a compilation? Who's the artist? Various, right? <laughs> so, you know, data modeling is not, it, it, like I said, it is probably the more complex part of building these types of systems. The, the smartest people and people that work on the back end, they can show that the data is structured and that the constraints are accurate to to reflect the business. Because Amazon has to ask these questions every day. Can you have a track without an artist? Where does it go? How do people find it? What page does it go on the website? <laughs> you know, all of these things. How do you create a compilation? How do you create a, somebody can create a playlist and that could be their album. How do we allow them to do, hey, that's another table. Let's, let's do that. You know? So this is what data modelers do. And if they do it right, Building the applications becomes a lot simpler because the rules are already built in. Okay? So birthday was kind of a semi-good idea, but not a great idea. What pertains to an artist? Label is a good one, but I think, again, it's a foreign key. An well, that's an album. Yeah, so that's a perfect thing for the album table. It's very good. Uh, artist Facebook page, very good. That's exactly right, Steve. Good work. So, uh, something like a, a recording artist typically has one Facebook page, where a fan page where people can like it and they can update them on what's going on. Uh, in fact, I think that's all Justin Bieber is is a Facebook page. Right? But, um, uh, but uh, and, and that would be one. That would typically be a unique one. So if I was modeling this for a real-world application, I would probably instill that as a rule. You don't have to have a Facebook page, but you can't have two. <laughs> right? It doesn't make sense. A lot of people have two, but it wouldn't make sense on our website. <laughs> you know, it just wouldn't make sense on any of the Facebook page one, Facebook page two. It just doesn't make sense. So uh, that's a very good one. Let's do... Uh, We just type the column in there, and then we would type the, uh, the, the column type, the data type. And for, for this, I would probably give it a var car, a variable number of characters. But 200 is probably more appropriate for a length for a URL. And we do not want to make it required. And we can just apply it, and it shouldn't have a problem. With that, does it need a foreign key? No. Uh, it is possible that you can enter a bad URL in there, but it's not, that is not going to propagate throughout your database. It's only in one spot, and it's easy to fix. Right? That's why we do database modeling. That's why entity elements go with those entities. <laughs> you know, uh, if we change rock, if, if one day Jeff Bezos comes into the office and says, you know, we're not selling rock albums these days. How about if we change the title to Rock and Roll? That will help our SEO. Well, do you want to go into every album that's been released since 1964 and update those? No, you would just go into the genres table and update that. And it would propagate that change on every album page that's appropriate on the website. Does that make sense? Again, more power of the master detail foreign key relationship thing. So uh, let's go over to the tracks table.
and mess around with that a little bit. Let's move it up. Record it coming in. Sidebar, why use bar card rather than text for data type? Uh, good question. So I believe, because I'm an old data guy, and var car was like the original data type, uh, uh, number one. Number two is uh, it's variable in length. So uh, databases can get very large. Right? Think of all the MP3 tracks that are available for sale on Amazon. Right? It might be in one database table. Well, if you have a text column, it's going to take up a certain amount of space and reserve that for every new row you create in your database. So that if you ever need to, even if you don't put a value in that text column, it's going to save it there because if you ever do, it doesn't have to mess around your, your data structures on the disk. If you use VARCAR, it's a little smarter. It only takes up the space that you allot to it because it's a variable length character set. So most people use VARCAR in that case. Uh, I'm not an expert. <laughs> Let me, let me say this. I, I'm not sure I can tell you what each of these data types means. Uh, and to some degree, like I said, I, I, I've been doing this for a long time. Uh, when I learned uh, we used, back in the 90s, we used VARCAR for strings. We used uh, ints for integers and um, Usually, either float or double for real numbers, for potentially decimal numbers. Uh, we talked about blobs. There's blobs, but now look at this. There's tiny blobs, medium blobs, long blobs. So, MySQL databases have evolved. There's all these different data types. Probably the best thing to do if you're interested in these, and I don't even know what these geometry things do or how they work. Uh, but if you're interested in any of these, just go to the MySQL documentation. What we're going to do, you probably use a blob for an image, a binary large object. If you keep it, you know, to a tiny blob, that might only allow you a 64K or something like that. And I don't know what the limits are. Uh, for, let's go and edit the track information. What's appropriate to it for a track? Like uh, length. Right, duration. Yep. And that would probably be a, that's a tough one. <laughs> you know, that's a complex object. You know, minutes, seconds. You know, how do you store it so if you ever want to order it? That's a tough one. You know, how do you make it so that, you know, the second number goes over 60 and things like the 59? So there's a time object, and it, you, you might be able to use that. Um, you, you might, you know, you can always use a string. It's just not going to be as useful. You know what I mean? So you probably want to take a look at that time object, and I, I have not looked into it and see how that would work and how sortable that is. I think it's more a time stamp than an actual duration type time, but we, we can take a look at it. At this point, I'll just call it a a var car, and you know that'll work. It just won't be as you 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 know won't have as much utility. Yep, we can have a, we can have a size. We can have a. Uh, what I want to show is some of these other data sets. So, uh, what would be a boolean, like a, a yes or a no, for a track? I don't know. Stereo, maybe. It's either in stereo or not in stereo. Is that? All right. Live versus studio. Very good. So live, uh, we could put that on the album or the track. It's probably more appropriate on the track because you could have an album where one side is live and another one is recorded in the studio. So let's say, uh, let's call this studio or uh, <laughs> studio recording. Uh, let's do this. Live re recording. And then uh, this can only have one of two values uh, if we assign it a Boolean data type. 
Si Blue yun niya. Huh. Am I like, uh, I think it's, um, I, I think the way they, huh, I, you know, I did this, so I use a different version of MySQL Workbench and it has a Boolean. Um, I think what you give it is a tiny, Int of one or something like that. Yeah. And then it's going to either be one or zero. So uh, I did this, you know, on my Mac. I've got an earlier version of MySQL Workbench than this. And, and it allows you to select Boolean. And what, but it doesn't really enter that in the database. It calls it a, a, what's called a tiny int. And a tiny int is a one decimal integer. One zero through nine, and for Boolean, we're only going to allow variables of zero to one. So, the point to remember, <laughs> there's two points to remember. One, MySQL Workbench, oh, my, my SQL doesn't natively allow Booleans. So, my SQL Workbench created a hack to allow you to do that. Right? Oracle does allow Booleans, I believe. Right, but we're not using Oracle. So MySQL Workbench can work with either database. <laughs> uh, that's one thing. The other thing is all you need to know is the definition of what a Boolean is. I think that that's an important thing to know. Does, does everyone know that? Right. So the bad news is you can't really store a native Boolean in a, data, in a MySQL database. So the way to do it is as this tiny int and using one or zero, to rep one to represent True, zero to represent false. MySQL has something a little cooler than Boolean though. It has something like, uh, something called enumerate, which is another free kind of uh, data constraint. So to use enumerate, let's, uh, let's pick a data field like um, format, right? And you could do, enum, and you put parentheses in there, and you could spell out what the values, what the potential values, allowed values are, right? So what are formats? I right, could use single quotes. CD, Oops. put a comma, eight track, comma, vinyl, and uh, comma, mp3, and then we need a closing parenthesis, and I think, cannot be except the previous value, so what, ah, two parentheses. It took all my stuff away because of an extra parenthesis. So let's do this. Ah, there we go. Okay. So I simplified it. CD and MP3. Uh, no, they do not. I just put them in the And when I submit that, Uh, this is an array. Well, this isn't necessarily an array, but it is very similar to an array. It's a set of that, an array. Well, what is an array? It is uh, an, an array is actually a variable with a series of values. And you're right. This is sort of like a we're telling it that the value you enter has to be one of these values, one of the one of the values in this array. Yeah, you could look at it as an array. So, uh, so let's do this. Let's go back. So we did that on tracks. If we go back to the tracks table and we refresh it, back into edit mode, we see our columns, right? And if I go to, let's say, you know, this track, and I try to put for format, if I put vinyl, 
and I apply that, it's a checker. So what good is a database constraint? What good is a database constraint? Did it take it? It didn't. It didn't. It, 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 it took the SQL statement, but it didn't allow me to assert a non-enumerated value. Does that make sense? If I enter, let me just finish this. If I enter CD here, which is one of the values, and I apply that, it took it again, and when I refresh the data, it really took it this time. It's in the database. For this exact purpose, uh, where there's, there's only a few accepted values and they never change. Mm -hmm. Male, female is a perfect example. Yeah, oh, well, maybe that might, yeah, <laughs> that might change as we go forward. But in general, if you have a form, you're pretty safe in saying, you know, male or female has a memory. You don't need a foreign key relationship for gender. It's the same everywhere in the world, and it's never changed, right? So you could use an enumerated for that, right? For, for format of a recording, it's probably not a good idea because new formats could come out, <laughs> and you'd have to update every column. You know, you know. So probably not a great idea. Uh, but for things that are immutable, you know, um, agenda is a good example. I can't think of too many others. What else, you know, what else is immutable? Size. Would size be good? Why would size not be good? Let's say you're selling shirts on Target.com. Do you want to enumerate the sizes for a product? Probably not, because what if you're out of stock of a size? You don't want, you know, you don't want the enumeration to sit in the database. You really want, <laughs> yeah. You know, there's different ways you can model that, but you know, size is more of a uh, a value than an enumeration. You might have different sizes, and they might change over time. Um, like I said, gender is a great one. Uh, like I just said, for something that is somewhat limited set and immutable. Does that make sense? Like gender, or uh, you know, I'm trying to think. What doesn't? Yeah, we're not talking about arrays. So we're talking about databases now, and I haven't mentioned the word array today. So let's not introduce that yet. We haven't talked about arrays yet, and we're not going. We might use one when we get into PHP, but databases don't have arrays. Countries. So countries sort of change, uh, but they're pretty stable. Uh, continents would be a good one. Yeah, continents are pretty immutable. You know, every hundred million years maybe they change. Not a lot. You might want to put Gaia in there just for the real old timers. But in general, I think continents have been pretty, well, they're not stable. They do move. The names, <laughs> the names typically, yeah, Amazon will be updated before a new continent is found on there. Although they just found one. Uh, right off of, in, in the Indian Ocean, they found a submerged lost continent, just like two weeks ago. I read way too much stuff on here. So, uh, so where are we? We are halfway through the class. Uh, we're out of snacks. We're out of energy. <laughs> we want to take a break. But why don't we take a break? And then what we're going to do is come back and write a PHP program that's going to go get the data from this database and put it on a web page. All right? So that's going to be fun. So I am going to oop, some questions out here. Uh, sidebar wire, data type, live or studio, I think I answered this. Okay, Paul, you got to remind me. Okay, we're back. So, uh, I am going to 
stop talking about databases in the context of MySQL Workbench for a while, and we're going to go into a PHP web page. We're going to create a PHP web page and look at SQL from that perspective. Taking the tables that we have here, genres, al artists, albums, and tracks, we're going to create a view that looks sort of like uh, what? Yeah. iTunes. <laughs> to get the tables inserted. Uh, what you do, you need that script, and the script is right here. It's on our web page. Oh, use, and then your username. Use uh, T X X X X, whatever you're using. Mine will be use space J-P-E-R-E-T-Z. To get your, that script to work, you might need to enter that to tell MySQL Workbench which database of yours to use. So, um, so to get started, let's create a new web page. Right? Uh, so we're going to open up Dreamweaver. And we are going to create a new PHP web page. OK. So uh, this is not what I wanted. This is like a, this page could have been created 15 years ago. It's an extra X HTML. So let's try that again. Yeah. It's like they ship it like this. General. Where is it? File types. All right. Uh, PHP. All right, let's do this. Get rid of all this. Well, let's just use this document. What the heck? My preferences, new documents, HTML5. OK, get out of here. New PHP page. OK, that looks a lot better. OK, the title of this document could be My Music. OK, so uh, before we get started in this, let's take a little, you know, let's just think about this database that we have. Where have you seen it before? Genres, artists, albums, tracks. iTunes, everybody's got it on their desktop. You, get, you open it up, it's got a table. <laughs> and it literally probably has columns that look just like that. Right? And that, where do you think that is coming from? It's probably a database. In fact, I know that iTunes has a version of SQLite sitting inside of it to manage all of those tracks that you have. Right? You, it exposes it through an XML interface. If you have a, Look in your iTunes library, there's typically like an XML file that categorizes that. Does anyone know what XML is? XML stands for Extensible Markup Language, but essentially it's a tagging language, just like HTML, that allows you to define what? What do you think? Hierarchical data structures. <laughs> just like we do in master detail relationships and databases. Right? You could have an XML structure that says, this is an artist, and this artist has these albums. And you do that just like you do in the tagging language like HTML. You put tags within tags. <laughs> you have artist, Rolling Stones, album, XXX, 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 and then you close the artist tag. And all the albums within the artist tag belong to that artist. Yeah, MySQL Lite is a, uh, I guess it's owned by a company called SAP now, 
but it's a very small uh, MySQL-like database, an SQL database that is embeddable into applications. Right? You can just, it's, it's small enough that it, it runs not as a, you know, an executable, but it runs as a library that you could link into other applications like iTunes and things like that. So there's, there's a number of companies, SQLite is probably the most commonly used mini database like that now, but Pervasive is another one. It's a company, I think they're still in California. No, they're in Pennsylvania. And I believe and they also do a very small, light, embeddable SQL database. And it's everywhere. You know, uh, Quicken uses that. And all, all, you know, if you think about it, Quicken is a database, you know. Um, I think, you know, don't quote me on this. I was in the database business and I called on the, my job was to go to other software companies, try to get them to use Oracle's database. So I know where my SQL is. I know, you know, so I know some of these things, but that, that was 10 years ago, so things could have changed. Um, but it's very common that applications rely on third-party databases. Because database technology, there's only about 10 working database management systems in the world. It's not an easy piece of software. Oracle charges a lot for its database, like $20,000 and up. Uh, MySQL gives away for free, uh, and, and it's perfectly adequate for many applications, but for very hard, you know, very complex and very large databases, you, you, you kind of need a more commercial strength. There probably is some limits on MySQL that, I don't know if Oracle put them in there or not, but that require you to upgrade. Uh, so, uh, but, it, but it's, it's very typical that an application would not build its own database. Even, even a... Facebook, I don't think, built their own database. They probably took the MySQL open source code and wrote their own version on top of that. The ability to build these tables and transactions within them is it's a pretty complex thing. Uh, well, it depends. You know, some e-commerce sites are built on software that is sort of like an e-commerce e store as an application. So uh, some are built from scratch, you know, using PHP or another language. Uh, but almost every e-commerce store is going to use a database. And they probably wouldn't write their own database management system is the point I'm making. Uh, and, and most e-commerce stores probably would not even write their own data model. They buy a packaged software that includes the data model. Like Quicken. When you buy Quicken, you don't model the data. Quicken has done that for you. You don't know that a check <laughs> is a row in a database. Right? A well-designed application should hide the database. When, you're, when you click play in iTunes, you don't know you're using a database. Right? But if you didn't have a database, it would be very difficult to organize the thousand songs that are in your playlist, or even to create a new playlist. Right? <laughs> Does that make sense? So, and, and iTunes probably is not going to write their own database management system. When things exist, for, you know, they could they could probably pay some licensing fee to take SQLite and embed it into their application. So we're going to create a very simple report that looks sort of like uh, iTunes to start with, and then we'll maybe get a little fancier. So the first thing we need to do when we work with PHP in MySQL is to look at this web page right here. So let me put that in our little window here for our fans at home. And it's on our website. I'll show you where it is. Is there a link for good uh, on the class for all the MySQL? There is. Uh, in fact, I posted it last week, Chad, uh, on our class site for last week, there is a SQL tutorial basic. And that's probably the best, here I'll open that up, it's probably the best place to go to get started on the SQL syntax. Uh, and when I say it's the best place, what I mean by that is it's a tutorial, not a reference. So if you're like me, you know, uh, references are great, but not probably the first place you want to go. 
because you need some reference before you can read a reference. You know, you need to know what it is you're they're talking about. So tutorials are good for that. Like, what is a database, and you know, what is SQL, and how how does it work, and what can it do? So I would suggest going through this, and by the time you get into like page one or two, you're going to be into SQL commands, like right here. This is the most basic SQL command. Select a column name from a table name, and then limit just tells you how many rows to return. Right? Uh, so if you, if you just ignore that limit, this is the most basic and, and simple SQL statement. Uh, there's even simpler ones. Here, let's open up our database. Sergio, I'm going to use yours for a minute. And we can literally just type in, we know that there are tables out there. Let's type in select artist from artists. All right? Select this column from this table. And when I enter that, what's going to happen? It's going to say select your database. Oh, no, it didn't. It knew. So different versions of MySQL database. So what do I get? I get a list of all the artists. That are in the, all the artists that are in the artists table, right? If I select star, I get all the columns. Star is the universal. Give me all the columns and all the rows in the artist table. If I say select all from artists where genres ID genres. <laughs> That's the foreign key to the genres table. Is equal to two. That will just give me the rock and rollers, right? If I select three, that will give me just the classical guys, right? So the, the key point is this right here. This is how simple SQL as a language is. Right now we're doing the C in CRUD, right? I mean, I'm sorry, the R in CRUD, read. We're reading records from the database and presenting them. I'm typing this into what's called the, the SQL, uh, I think they call it the scratch pad or something. Uh, I just literally opened up. Uh, it, it opens automatically when I, if I open up a connection, the default is to open up that scratch pad. And right from there, I could do select album from albums. It's the exact same place I, I pasted the SQL that created the tables before. You could literally paste it in there and click the lightning bar and it should run. Yep. Or you could open a script. You could, you could, if you have, if you save it to a file, you can open the script, and it'll and run it that way. You could, you know, uh, but or you could just paste it in and hit run, and it should run. So the point is, SQL is basically English. In fact, when Oracle was first released, they called their SQL version, even though it was SQL. They call it the English query language because it's so easy to write. You literally, if you name your columns appropriately, the syntax is very simple. Select from where. Select is followed by a set of one or more column names. From is a set of one or more table names. And where is the condition that you want to instill to make that selection bring back the records that you want returned. Select from album, from albums, the album where, let's say artists, artists, I think it's ID artists. My SQL Workbench comes up with some crazy naming by default for its foreign keys. This is the way it does it. Where artist uh, 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 is, let's say, greater than two, right? So this will give us all the artists other than the, fir other than the first two. 
all the albums from the artists other than artist one and artist two. Right? So if we go back to the artist table and edit the data, you can see we're not getting any Miles or Coltrane. We're just getting albums from these artists in this result set. Does that make sense? You might know, not know what these albums are. You guys might just know Jay-Z and Beyonce, but trust me, <laughs> there's no uh, Miles or Coltrane album here. Yeah, yeah, uh, this code? No, the uh, this output. It's just feedback from the database. Yeah. It's just the database returning its, re its, its it's message back to you, not the data, but the message it, about that data. This list is the data. Right now, I'm just querying the database. I'm just selecting. If I wanted to do something like this, uh, insert into genres. Right. Yeah, you would write an application. That's what we're going to do now. Right. I'm just showing you the SQL syntax. We're now going to create a web page that has that SQL syntax. Okay? So you guys saw how to query the database. Right? You, you can ask it a question. Select blah from blah. That is great if you're in SQL Workbench, but it's useless. You don't want you know, you don't want to give an Amazon customer SQL Workbench and say enter an order or figure out what albums there are, you know. It's for developers. It's for people who are building the tables. Right? It's our job as programmers to create applications so people don't have to use a spreadsheet or something like that to work with data, right? So let's do that. In order to do that, you sort of have to delve into the PHP MySQL library. Right? What do I mean by that? PHP is a programming language. We've used it for a couple of different things. We figured out how old we are. We figured out, we sent an email with it right a couple of weeks ago. In order to use PHP to crud, <laughs> in order to use PHP to interact with data in a database, you need a special library that's called the MySQL library. Right? It has special functions that allow you access to the database. And this MySQL library is old. It's out of date. We're not going to learn that. We taught that last year, and nobody uses it anymore. Right? That's gone. That's, to, that's so 2012. This is now 2013, and we use the object-oriented implementation of the MySQL library, which is called MySQLi, or the improved MySQL library. Right? Who writes PHP? Develop, who are they? Who do they work for? They work for Adobe. They work for Oracle. They work for the JC. Yeah. It's, it's an open source language. <laughs> Anyone can submit functions to it. So s somebody wrote a MySQLi library that's a better implementation. It works better than MySQL. It gives you more flexibility. It has more features, more commands. So we don't use the old one anymore. Yeah, so uh, this library is not something you have to install. Uh, it's just a set of commands that we're going to use in PHP. It might be something that has to be installed by a system administrator somewhere back there in the PHP Wizard of Oz land. But for our purposes, and for the purposes everywhere you're ever going to build a website, Danica Patrick's place, or wherever, you know, Sonic.net, the JC, every, almost every PHP implementation, unless it's like eight years old, has a MySQL and, a My, and also a MySQL I. I was joking, we did teach it last year, but it's been around for several years. So it, it's, it's kind of ubiquitous. You know, 
PHP is just about anywhere you can run a website, you're going to have the ability to run PHP on it. And almost all implementations of PHP today have MySQLi installed and ready for your use. So to get going with it, literally all we have to do is write some code. That's the beauty of it. And what's the first thing we do to write code in PHP? We need the question mark. So we need this little PHP thing. And then, of course, we need to close that. Oop. Oop. I can't type today. So I now have a PHP region on my web page that I can use to write some code. OK? So P my SQLI, like I said, is a library that's just baked into PHP. So what I'm going to do is create a new variable. And let's just call it uh, music, for lack of a better thing. And say uh, music is going to be equal to uh, ah, let's take a step back. Let's take a step back. Let's see. First thing we need to do is to get a data connection. So let's create a variable called data connection. And that we're going to assign to a new instance of my SQLI connection. Okay? So that's going to be a new MySQLi. And we are going to put in here the information that we need to pass it so that it connects to our database. We need four pieces of information. The same four pieces of information we just entered in MySQL Workbench. It's the stuff you need to connect to a database. This is exactly what's going to go in here is exactly the, the enter you know, the login screen from MySQL Workbench. So the first thing we're going to put is our database location. We could enter student.sanarosa.edu. But we, a better way of doing it is to use the term local, local host. Right? And local host will work because our PHP server and our MySQL server are running on the same computer, right? So you don't even need an IP address. All, compu all Unix computers typically alias a name, their own IP with the, with the server name localhost. So you can, get, you can get to it through there. You can, it'll look up in the DNS, the local DNS. It'll find localhost. It'll connect you to the local SQL implementation. So the first thing you put in there is localhost. Why don't we use localhost in my SQL workbench? Yeah, because we're running over a network. It doesn't know what host to go to. In this case, we're running on the same computer. If you're running MySQL Workbench on a computer that is also running your MySQL database, like you are, you can put localhost in there and it will work. If, you're, if, it's, if, it's, if your PHP is set up here. Or your DNS is set up there. I use double quotes. Uh, for PHP, it's interchangeable. Uh, it, you know, it's probably better practice to use single quotes, like I said last week, because if you're using uh, HTML in your strings and you want to pass attributes, sometimes you want to double quote those. You don't have to, but oftentimes you do. So uh, the next thing I want to put is your database user ID. And uh, I could use mine here. I won't use Sergio's. And then you would put your <coughs> password. And then you would put the database that you want to connect to. In your case, it's going to be your username. In most cases, yours might be a little different. But if you're on the Santa Rosa student server, it's going to be, it would be this. I'm going to use test because I'm special. And then your password, you have to put in your password. The database uh, name, the schema name. So it's your user ID, the same as your Unix user ID.
that password is the password that you got last week when you typed in SQL me. One of those passwords. That is that is not mine. That's mine. But don't copy my password. You can change your grades if you copy my password. <laughs> It's going to be on the test on the midterm. What is my password? So what am I doing here? What I've created, I've written one PHP statement, right? I've created a variable called data connection, and that variable is a handle. It's a reference to this database connection. I can now use this to submit SQL statements. Once I have a database connection, I can use it to submit SQL statements. Does that make sense? So I could do something like, now I could create a variable called music. And music is going to be a reference to this data connection and a query. Come on. And bang. So and this will have that. So um, so what does this mean? Uh, I have I create a new MySQL data connection and I give it the name data connection. And then I using that data connection, once I have that data connection, I have access to a whole bunch of SQL commands. So if we go into the documentation here, and I look into this section called connections, this is where I got this code from. Create a new connection called, in this case, they're calling an outdated connection, but they're giving it the name MySQLi. That to me is a little confusing, but it works, because the object is also named MySQLi. And then they pass it, the information they need to pass it. And then they do a little test here, just to make sure it's connected. And send a little message back to the page, right? How do we send data back to a PHP page? From PHP back to the web page? We did this. We used that echo command. It's one way of doing it. And that's what they're doing here. They, they echo back to the page. That connection didn't work if the connection returns a connection error. Right? So we can actually even take this and put this in our code. I'm not going to do that just to keep it simple. But obviously, this is very good practice. Sometimes in my tutorials, I won't do the right thing. Because doing the right thing takes a lot more code and might obscure the simple, basic concepts I'm trying to teach. But in general, for those of you who program you know, real sites, you almost always would want to include some kind of error checking. Right? To make sure that before you go asking questions in the database, make sure your connection is there. Right? Just like when you click on the connection here, here, uh, you know, if you can't get a connection, it'll tell you before it gives you this. You know, good applications sort of don't let you do something if you haven't done the thing that's required to do them. That makes sense. So. Uh, in here is going to be the actual SQL statement, right? So here we could just take, you know, we already wrote some SQL statements. Uh, I think I got rid of them, but let's yeah, let's just do this. Oh, uh, you mean it on the web page? Um, Oh, why do they have to, uh, special meaning? They're, sh they're demonstrating local host and how it works. So th these are two different ways of doing it. Yeah, you don't have to do them both. It's demonstrating that they both work equally identical. The one with the, I'm not sure what brackets. I'm sorry? Uh, this right here? Yes. 
And so th this is one statement. It's hard to see because of the way the page is squeezed on this page, but that is one statement. It's echoing back a string failed to connect, and then it's giving you the error number, and then it's giving you the error text. So let's talk a little bit about PHP. Okay? PHP, like many languages, has the concept of an object. In other words, it's an object-oriented programming language. And what an object is, is a sort of like an entity in a programming language that has multiple properties or methods. Okay? So, uh, <laughs> we're learning a lot today. So, sort of like the master detail relationship is a pattern that computer programmers use to model the real world, an object is a pattern that computer programmers use to model the real world also. But it's slightly different. An, an object, like I said, is something, it's a thing that has one, properties, and two, methods. Properties are typically adjectives, and methods are typically verbs, things they can do. So if you were going to model uh, the animal kingdom, <laughs> First of all, we can do it hierarchically, like I said before. We can, you know, organize everything into a taxonomy that's hierarchical. A house cat is a feline, that is a carnivore, that is a mammal, that is a vertebrate, that is a animal, <laughs> right? Uh, that doesn't tell you a lot. All it tells you is what, where a cat fits into a into a organizational structure. It doesn't tell you anything about the, what a cat is. It doesn't tell you that a cat has fur and claws and ear. You know, it doesn't tell you about a cat. So an object is a more refined way than a hierarchy of modeling information. And you could say a cat inherits all the properties of what it came from, sort of like a master detail. So it inherits everything that a feline has, but it's typically of this size and typically has this DNA or whatever. So let's look at how we would model an, obje a, 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 an object like a cat. We'd say a cat has properties. It has four legs. It has fur, adjective-like properties. And when we create a cat in a programming language, you could say create a new cat and give it white fur. <laughs> we could say its, it's fur property is equal, or fur color property is equal to white. Its fur length property is equal to curly, or Persian, or whatever it is. Its, uh, you know, its height is equal to this. So those are types of properties that are like adjectives. We can also give an object what are called methods, which are more like verbs, which are abilities. A cat can breathe. A cat can jump. A cat can eat a mouse. So you could give it an adjective, a verb. You could say, this cat jumps. <laughs> and if the cat has the ability to jump, then the object should have a method called jump or something like that. So when you model things in objects, sort of like, just like in a database, first you define the structure and then you use it. Objects are the same way. You define an object structure, and then you typically use it. And when you use it, it's known as ins you instantiate it. You instantiate means you create one. You create an instance of one. So what are we doing here? We didn't create the MySQL I object. Somebody programmed that. It's a bunch of code with methods and properties that allow us to interact with a database, sort of like a cat, but not like a cat. And what we're doing here is instantiating one. We're saying, I want a MySQL I connection, and I'm going to call mine, you know, furry or whatever. <laughs> or in this case, data connection, because furry is a good name for a cat, but not a very good name for a database connection. So does that make sense? If you were going to create a, a new, if you were programming, you know, a game of cats, <laughs> cats and mice, you would program what a cat is, 
by defining an object that has all the characteristics and abilities of a cat. But once your game started, when somebody clicked on a button to create a new cat, that would instantiate a cat that has specific properties. It doesn't have only the ability to have fur, it, it has a certain type of fur, right? So we are all of the people object, but we're all very different. We all have our own properties. We can all, we all share methods. We can all do the same thing. We can type, we can program, we can take classes, we can teach, whatever. But, you know, you're Paul, I'm Jay, we have our unique capabilities. We're instances of the people class. Does that make sense? That's why I think you're a little off. Classes. In many object-oriented programming languages, one specific object is typically referred to as a class. There are exceptions to that. Uh, PHP actually calls them objects for whatever reason. JavaScript does too. C++ and Java call them classes. So it could be a little. If you want an instance of a class, then you get an object. Then you get an object. That's correct. So PHP and, and JavaScript are a little sloppier when, when it comes to their terminology. And, uh, and, and people typically use the word, if you look in the documentation uh, here, it will probably refer to these things as objects, like the MySQL I object. It's just a terminology thing, uh, but you, you, you're correct all that. If you have a, like a C++ or Java background, this would be like a class. Class in the not, not this class, but you, you know what I mean. So, um, so what does that mean to the program we're trying to create? Why am I talking about this? This is the class. There could be more. There could be many. Each of us has our own connection to the database. There could be more than one, even on this page. On this page, I'm calling this particular connection, this instance of it, data connection. And with this connection, I'm going to be able to submit multiple SQL statements. What is query in this case? What does this mean? It is a method of the MySQLi connection class or object. It's a method. It's a behavior. A database connection can run a query, just like a cat could jump or a person can type. Right? So we need to not only tell it to run this query, we need to tell it what query to run. Okay? So let's give it a query to run. Let's say uh, select, let's do one of the simple ones that we know already works. Select artist from artists. Right? And the, the, uh, the arrow is the... Yeah, yeah, very good point. This silly arrow is kind of crazy. Programmers, people who have used other programming languages as driven crazy by PHP's silly characters here. Uh, in almost all other languages, that would be a period. That would be what's called the dot notation. Typically, you would have uh, a method or a property of an object would be followed by a dot and then whatever that method or property name is. Right? PHP uses this arrow. It's just the way it is. So uh, that, you know, you don't believe me, that's the way it is. <laughs> see, so anywhere you see uh, these arrows, it's really looking at a, either a property or a method of a particular object. Okay? So now what is this? Is this a property or a method? It's probably a it's probably a property. It's, it's the error number of that connection. It's the error number that was returned back to that connection. So it's, a, it's an adjective-like thing. It's not a, whereas query is, you know, where does it have query in here? Let's see. Query is called as a function is with, uh, with parentheses, which means that it's typically a command, something you're telling the MySQLi to do. So all of this concept and theory stuff is good to know, but it's abstract. And you could build a lot of killer stuff on the web without really knowing what an object is. You know, if you're willing to sort of learn as you go, you don't really have to know this stuff. You could just follow along the type and get it to work. Uh, and there are probably, you know, most students probably go through 
uh, several classes of computer science concepts before they start programming like this. So these web programming classes are a little tricky. You're being asked to be programmers. You might not have thought you needed to know what an object is or what an instance is or what a method is. And you don't, you don't really. Uh, I don't think I'm going to ask questions like that on the midterm, you know, theoretical programming questions like that. So I don't think you'll find questions like that, but just pay attention either way. It is good stuff to know, and this terminology becomes very important because, as, I, as I've said many times, by its very nature, programming is sort of a, a teamwork, a, a, a social thing. And like in any type of profession, if you don't use the right terminology, you can't be a professional. You know, you can't say, what's the name of that thing you created so that connection thingy that you created so I can database thingy, that query thingy? Nobody's going to want to really give you an answer, right? It's very important in programming that you try to use the right terminology or nobody will know what you're talking about. Right? Question. What is that thingy over there? That's correct. Yeah. So as you can see here, this is really where the magic of this class starts. What did I say last week? The only language that a database speaks is SQL. However, SQL is not really a robust enough language to build. First of all, you can't build a website with SQL. And you really can't do anything except work with a database. So SQL is sort of like a utility language. And in this case, we're inserting the SQL into the PHP. We're submitting the query using PHP, but the query itself needs to be expressed in SQL. And that statement right there is sort of, you know, a, a, a cornerstone of our class, a very important core. That is where PHP and MySQL meet, right? PHP can't talk directly to a database. A database doesn't know what PHP is. It only knows how to answer SQL, select, insert, update, delete, create a table. It doesn't know anything else. But it's not really a language that you can do anything with other than work with a database. So you need two languages together, believe it or not, to build an application that works with a database. And there are many languages that have a SQL or a MySQL library in them. It's not just PHP. Uh, ASP, Ruby on Rails, Python, Visual Basic, Excel, Access, every one of those has the ability to submit SQL to a server and get data back. They have a SQL library built into them. Right? and many, many other languages and tools and other things. Uh, we're using PHP because it's, it's actually very easy. We're going to write a couple of lines of code and get some data out of a database, hopefully. So right now, what have we done? We've just created a query. We've created a query that is connected to this connection. The query is going to go against the database. Now we need to write the programming logic to get the data back on the page. Right? We have to fetch the rows. And in PHP, we have to do that, what's known as incrementally. We need to create a loop that fetches all the rows that are returned, right? Because this query is going to return zero of all rows, right? So that is also relatively straightforward. What we're going to do is type in a, what's called a while loop, right? A while loop says, while this connection is true, run this code, right? That's the structure of it. While whatever is in here is evaluates to true, run this code, and it'll do that until whatever is in there doesn't evaluate to true. So we want some kind of way of saying, is there a row? Because <laughs> we want to loop through each of the rows that are returned from the database. So let's just create a new variable called row. I could name it anything, but for simplicity's sake, I'm going to call it row. 
and I'm going to say that row should be assigned the value of the what's called the fetch object. Oops. What is it doing? I think it's why is it trying to shut me down? This time. Uh. Well, then I won't save it. Oh, there we go. Oh. All right. Sorry about that. I think I hit the wrong button. Fetch underscore object. And fetch underscore object is a method. So we're going to give it that command syntax. We're going to get the two parentheses will follow it meaning it's a function, run that function. It's an ability of what is music now? Is music the data connection? No, it's the result set of the query. Can you use get? What do you mean? No, you want to use fetch. Can you use get? Is get in here? Is there a get object? Is that what you're asking? My SQL, all right. Is there a, I don't think there is. A, you have to use fetch object. Did you see a get object in here? No. You're just making it up? So what are we doing here? We're saying what, for each loop, we have the MySQL fetch object, object, and we're going to assign it to a variable called row. So now within this loop, we can refer to what's in that row, right? So we could say uh, echo row, and row is an object. Row is an object that has properties. The properties that row has is the columns that were returned from the database call, right? So we only got one column, in this case, artist, right? And I think we should just be able to echo row artist, and that should return the data to our page, right? So what I need to do to run this is create a site. Uh, What's my password? Cool. And let's do. Okay, let's, let's going to see that I'm, okay, so I want to, uh, let's do this. Um, I'm calling all this stuff test. Okay, save that, save that. Okay, and now I am going to save this page in that folder. Update links, no links to update. Okay, now I'm going to go over here and update that to my save. I have no dependent files. And now if I go to here, or let's just run it from Dreamweaver or try to. Yeah. 
Oh, it's got to be a testing scanner. <coughs> loading, loading, loading. Page not found. So did, did I not put it up there? Shouldn't have put it up there automatically. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. Oh, I know why. It's got to be in like test, test. Thank you. Still can't find it. All right. Test on here, but oh, here we go. It's huh. Let's All right, let's do this. Well, we know that that's there, right? Why couldn't we find it? Oh. So this isn't. Ah, because it's at the same level as, here we go. Sorry about that. So nothing is working. Let's see. There's no data coming back. This basically returns no data. So what are we doing now? Echo is right here. Data connection. Well, one thing we want to do, but this shouldn't affect it, is one thing you want to make sure you do whenever you, you create a data connection is to close that data connection. Right? So you want to go. You want to give it the close command. Close command is that, close. So it's the close method on the data connection. But it still doesn't say, uh, OK, let's see this. Ah, I know what it is. No, nope, that's fetch object. Select artist from artists. Huh. Maybe my password? Yeah, let me do this. Um, Hmm. Well, data's not coming back. Anyone got the data? Anything? My code work. Could you have a MySQL connection problem? I could. Localhost. So let's do that. How would I know if I had a connection problem? All right. I would want. Yeah, let me see if I can get a, if I'm getting a connection. I copy this code. What? I should have checked. No, I told you. Echo was the check the connection. All right. There we go. Copy that. Paste that there. Paste that there. Paste that there. Save it. Take this and drag it into the right folder. No database problem. So, 
Do I not have my table in test? Uh, you know what? I'm going to do this. Uh. Yeah, I might have. Let me uh, let me get Sergio's. <laughs> Where is it? Anybody see Sergio here? Here we go. Copy that. Go back here. Sergio, I'm going to test in your account because it might be a connection or a database problem. And then I am. If anybody messes up Sergio or my database, it's automatic failure. <laughs> I would have to catch Okay, now I'm going to drag this crazy thing into the right place. Try it again. Oop. Ah, okay, so we get some data. It was my database that was the problem. I, was, I got a connection to my database. For some reason, I can't figure this out. When I'm at home, I could use that test database, but from this computer, I thought it was MySQL Workbench, but even in PHP, I can't get to that database. So it's kind of a weird thing. But I got my data back. So what do I do? I select artist from artists and I return the data. It looks pretty ugly, right? There's no structure to it, right? I could easily add structure, right? I could go back to my PHP program and I could just write structure directly into the echo. You know, I could do something like this. Uh, create a string. There is a paragraph tag. And create a another string that is a, a closing paragraph tag. And I'm going to leave some paragraphs. The right way to do this is what? Let's just try this. We save it. We. Uh, I'll tell you what. That is a period, and I'll tell you what that is in a second. So now we should get these back in in keys, right? So uh, the question from Anna is, what is that syntax, what does that refer to? What does that period do? We, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago. It, it does the opposite. It, it joins them. It's, it's the what? It's the what operator? The concatenation operator. The concat so remember, terminology counts, right? Terminology, if you could say concatenation, you're a programmer. If you say it merges them, you know, you're a water group. You're just not, you're not up there, you know, unfortunately. Yeah. It, it, it puts them together into that thing. No, concatenation is joining two strings to create one string, and a string is a string of characters, so if you add one and one together, you get what? You get 11 or you get O-N-E, O-N-E, depending on what one is, right? Uh, so in PHP, we do concatenation. The concatenation operator is designated by the, is it a comma? It's a period, right? In JavaScript, we also have the ability to do concatenation, but we do concatenation with a plus sign. So that can be very, very confusing. That's why I'm pointing that out. I think that's the second time I pointed that in this class. So we are concatenating. We're creating a new echo will always push out a string to the page. Right? And what we're doing is saying create a new string that has that's wrapped in paragraph tags. All right. So watch this. Before before we allow uh, 
before we allow these guys over here to steal Sergio's password, I'm going to do this. I'm going to take it completely out of this program, right? I'm going to put this PHP tag back, right? Watch this. I'm going to save this file. I'm going to create a new PHP file. I'm going to get rid of all this. This is not going to be a page. I'm going to paste that right there. Okay? So I'm going to do what's called a PHP include. Right? And this is, this is putting part of your PHP in one file and part of your PHP program in another file. So for database connections, you, you almost always want to do this. Why? Number one, you don't want yeah, you don't want Irene to see your password. So <laughs> number two, number two, as you write these applications, right now we're just getting a list of the tracks, but you might write 40 or 50 different SQL PHP programs, one to insert a track, one to insert an album. But, you know, so you don't want to have to write that connection in every one of those programs. You could centralize them to one file. If you change the password, you don't have to go to all those files and remember what that meant. Or if you move your database from one server to another, it's centralized. So PHP has this really cool function. It's very simple to use. We're going to save this file. I hate Windows. We're going to save this file as, uh, let's just call it connection.php. Right? Uh, because, oh, that's a good question. Uh, in include files, you open them, you open the PHP tag, but you never close them. And what we're going to do now is go back to our test page, and all we have to do is dollar sign uh, is include. I just called it connection.php. You can call it whatever you want. You just have to refer to it with that name right here. And just by using this include, it's going to go out and find that file and put it into your file and make it look like one. And now, Irene can't see our password. Uh, we can continue to work. We Single quotes are interchangeable in this case. But like I said, you're almost always better off using single quotes in PHP. Uh, but you could use either in, in PHP and JavaScript, I believe. So, so, the, so you have an opening PHP tag there and a closing one on that page, but on the other page, the other file, you only need yeah. one? Yeah, so it's kind of wacky. So on this page, in here, this is going to open a new one, right? We know that connection has an open PHP, but it doesn't close it. That's kind of wacky, but that's the way it is. Uh, in PHP, when you use includes, the proper way to do them is to open the PHP but not ever close it. Even if it always close because the include is going to be part of a PHP function in another file. So ultimately it will get closed. And you don't want to close it. You don't have to have a matching. This is one case, one rare, rare case where you don't have to, you don't have to match it. It, the best practices is not, yeah, so, the, so let's, let, let's, let's look at this. Uh, PHP include closing, see somebody's Googled that before. So here we are at Stack Overflow. Stack Overflow is by far the best place for programmers. I mean, why? Because it does exactly what our class website does. It's social, you know. People post questions, people answer them, and people grade those answers. And if you, know, if, if you get good answers, uh, people will grade them because they work for them, and people know it works. So here we'll say you go through this, and I'll probably explain why if you want to do more research. Yeah, so Stack Overflow is something I've showed you before. Let's put it in the class site, and 
I didn't type in Stack Overflow. I Googled a term. Yeah, so that is a link on our website. The whole PHP MySQL I documentation is linked on our website. And this is the first page of it, and that's where I got that. Right? This is just something I Googled to get an, answer, an ad hoc answer. Somebody asked me, how does this work? This is not going to be on the test. <laughs> you, don't have to study, you don't ever have to look at this page. Where is a, as, a, as, a, as a class looking at this page to answer the student's question, why don't you have to close the PHP tag? I don't know. Uh, but it, it creates unexpected behavior if you do. And you could probably read an article like this if you want to learn more. Uh, the important point is this, the include statement. This is used all the time in PHP. Right? It's one of the better, most useful features in PHP. In fact, if you only learn one thing about PHP, the include statement, that alone could revolutionize how you build websites. Do you use Dreamweaver's library function? Does anyone ever use that? Dreamweaver's, yeah, because it's, it's a client side thing. You know, you have to have a Dreamweaver site for it to work. PHP includes perform a similar function, but they're service side. They, they work automatically. You don't, they don't need Dreamweaver or some other software to put them together. It just works. It's exactly the code that we have there before. It's, it's just the connection. I didn't, I didn't change that code at all. I just moved it to a different file. Right? And, and when I moved it to another file, I could include it like this. Now, there's another statement, like include, that's called require. And that means include, but if you can't find that file, stop. Don't go any further. Include is a little softer. It'll try to find that file. If it doesn't find it, it'll keep running the PHP program. In this case, of course, our PHP program wouldn't work anymore. So I'm just using require so I get a PHP error if it can't find that file. And then if I I set up my directories around here, so I've got to keep going back to this stupid method. Of Come on. And if I reload my page, the behavior shouldn't change anymore, right? But my programming structure is a little different. My database connection information is in a separate file, right? So, there's, like I said, there's some usefulness in that. One, it's kind of semi-hidden. You can't see it in all the files. Two, it's in one place if you need to change it. Three, for your GitHub repositories, you might want to uh, ignore, you know, if you're posting, <laughs> you know, for our student site, it doesn't make much of a difference. But think about it. If you're using a PHP application and you're using GitHub repository, and it's a public repository, if you put your database connection include file on there, people can see it, right? So, uh, and connect to your database. So, uh, typically, it's, you could do a git ignore on that. You could say, I need that file to run my application, and, and I know that it's part of my application, but I don't want it as part of my repository so it's not publicly visible so people can't see the password. Right? So, uh, we're just about out of time. So uh, let's just review this really quickly. Very, very kind of simple structure. There's a lot, a little bit of syntax here, but you know, without a lot of, without a lot of theory, we can kind of get through and see what it's doing. We create a database connection in this file. We then create music is a what? It's a result set, right? If you think about it, we're creating a query on data connection, and a query is going to be expressed with a SQL statement, and then we're assigning that query to a variable, dollar sign music, and dollar sign music is going to contain what comes back from the database for that query. 
and it's going to have properties and methods that allow us to use it to get at that data. And the property, the method that we're using primarily here is fetch object. So you submit a query, but then you have to fetch each row. In this case, I'm fetching it as an object. So I can refer not only to the row, but to its properties, which are the columns that will return. And I assign it here into a, a new variable so I can refer to it within the context of this while loop. And it puts it out on the page. From here, I could increase the complexity of my query and get different reports that do the same thing. You know? So what we're going to do next week is explore some of that. How do you join tables together in a query? Because being able to query one table at a time isn't very useful. You can figure out the artist, but not his albums, <laughs> or his tracks, or his genre. You can figure out his genre ID, but that doesn't really help you much. right? So we're going to learn how to join tables in SQL. And even more important, we're going to learn how to uh, organize these fetches back into a tabular structure. Because when you're returning data to a web page, you, you typically want it into some kind of table so you can see it. People like tables. What's the first thing you learn in web design? You know, don't use tables. You know, never use HTML tables, right? Except when you're using them for a table, right? And almost all the data we're going to be working with is somewhat tabular, right? What is what is the iTunes interface? It's a table. <laughs> you know, you get uh, who are the artists? Who are the you know they clean up a little bit with the album covers and some of that stuff, but when you get to an actual album, it's a table of the tracks in that album. If you go to an artist, it's a table of the artist of the albums and the tracks for that artist. So we're going we're gonna to work this result set into a HTML table structure. And that is something you can already figure out. We got it in paragraphs. That's pretty straightforward. Most important, we're going to navigate Next week, we'll navigate the structure, the hierarchy. So we're going to do, here, I'll show, you, I'll show you the example. If we look at, uh, let's say, this one, I'm taking out my test database. <laughs> I don't know why it doesn't work. Oh, maybe it's a network thing or something. I don't know. Anyway, uh, what I was what I was going to show you, unfortunately, I can't because for some reason I can't get at my database from here. But what we're going to do is create a hunt. Just like the tables are a hierarchical structure, we'll create a report that not only shows the tabular version but the hierarchical version. And that, I think that'll be a lot of fun. So uh, we are we're in overtime. We're in double overtime. Uh, let's see if there are any questions. It's locked in. That is correct. So when no next row while exits, manual not clear on this auto increment. It's not auto increment. It's the while, Steve, that's actually doing. It's the while along with the fetch object. Fetch object returns true, and while evaluates that true, to it's really. It, it's not auto increment. It's called uh, iteration. Okay, you're not creating new elements, you're iterating through the elements that are there, which is incrementation or incrementing. Uh, but yeah, you're, you're essentially right. I, I modified your terminology with one word, but you're, you're right on, Steve. That's exactly how Fetch Object works. Any questions? Any other questions? We got, we got about half of where I thought we'd get today. <laughs> and we didn't even have the lab part of it, which we were trying to say, let's Save a little bit at the end of the class to go around the room. But does everyone feel like they kind of got what we were talking about? Is this? Yeah. So, so one thing is, uh, so I'll, I'll say a little bit about that. Uh, it is a challenge. Uh, Client-server computing means you get, you're hooking these things up, <laughs> and sometimes 
we're prevented from doing so. And the reality is, in our classroom, we're doing it ourselves. The reason I can't get to my database and the reason you can't get to yours is because there's a firewall in this classroom that, pre that, that prevents 3306 traffic and other types of traffic to go over the network. So all I can do is apologize for that because it's kind of ridiculous. Uh, this actually works a lot better in any other room. This room is kind of on a firewall because it's like an IT room that Mike runs, you know, he teaches networking conferences here. So it, it's not the ideal room for us. And it's, it's just the way it is. I, I, I didn't want to do this. <laughs> I wanted the room across the hall, but it was taken. So uh, I apologize for that, but I, it, you know, it's something I have control over. Uh, it, should, it should always work in this room if you use the computers in this room. Uh, the problem with that is, you know, it might not be your oper you know, operating system you're used to, and you know, doesn't have all your stuff on it. And for you, it's an upgrade, though. So <laughs> I've got to use it every. Can you go over the for each again? I don't think there's a for each. There's a while. There's a while loop, um, and I think I explained it. I think we're out of time, uh, but I will. We will review this next week. So uh, that's it. We'll see you next week, and then the week after is spring break. So see you guys in the Bahamas then. And, uh, Great. Okay. Final will be after the next class. The midterm. Uh, the midterm will be open. After, will we will review during the class and then we'll open it the next day? It won't be open before the next class. You won't miss it. How do I get out of this session? Oh, my God. How do I stop this? That'd be good. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, database of your library. That'd be a good one. Your wedding, you could have all your guests, the presents, the, you know, there's, there's many applications. Yeah, she's still Recipes?